Coming up on this episode of Bitcoin for Millennials. The questions that I got from these financial advisors and wealth managers were really, really intelligent questions. Um, they were asking about sharp ratios. They were asking about average returns against major indexes. They were asking about self custody options, even if they're financial advisors and wealth managers. Um, they uh, they were they were ahead of me on my slide. So as I'm breaking down what mm. blockchain actually is, they're they're kind of asking questions that are three slides ahead. And I, I kind of paused mid keynote and I thought, oh, my God, they, they are really coming. This is it. Like mm. we've all been waiting. You know, we've been saying the institutions yeah. are coming for a long time. And I, I left that completely convinced that the institutions are now coming. Yeah. Um, and that's what got me so hyped up uh, to jam that that Twitter thread out there because I was like, guys, you know, the stack time, certainly the time for the average, you know, Joe or Jane to, to get their a whole Bitcoin. It's just coming. It's coming to an end. All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. In this episode, I'm joined by Keith Laska. He's a professor of Bitcoin at Fordham University in New York. He's passionate about Bitcoin, but was frustrated by the lack of high quality, easy to understand education. Because to understand Bitcoin, he spent hours on YouTube, social media, books, attending conferences. And he concluded that Bitcoin is a once in a generation uh, money transformation. And most people won't understand it until it's too late. So he put together a team of passionate Bitcoiners and launched Learn Bitcoin, a Bitcoin education network. And uh, yeah, I'm super excited to talk with you today, man. So uh, welcome. Yeah, thanks so much, Bram. Appreciate uh, getting the invite. Well, you're obviously super orange built now, but uh, when you discovered it, was there a, a belief that made you not get into it? Uh, oh, boy. Uh, I actually wrote a, a Medium post on this, which I could share with you at some point in the future. Uh, I, I've, I've been in tech for a couple decades. So I'm, I'm kind of on the risk curve, uh, always kind of chasing illiquid opportunities in the market with startups. <laughs> uh, and so when, when Bitcoin came along, I kind of understood the, the technology component of it. Where I was uh, completely behind was in the kind of macroeconomics uh, uh, and finance component of Bitcoin. And, and you know, that's something that had chased up over the years. So I think if anything, it was really understanding how the world works today, right? The, the economy, how money printing works, how uh, the countries operate. That was, that was really eye-opening in, in, in my journey uh, and learning about Bitcoin. Yeah, super interesting. I, I have a similar background and that economy and finance part is something that I, I don't come from. But like the last three years, that's been kind of like the... The, the, like the two dimensions that really got me even deeper in, into the rabbit hole than, than I was before. Um, because I think, you know, this is probably also the most important thing for people to, to understand. But yeah, I, I think we'll definitely get there in this, in this conversation. But I also wanted to ask, can you like reconnect your steps? For me, it's like really hard, like how, how you actually got here. But do you remember a, a moment in time where it like really clicked for you? Yeah, I mean, I'll do the, the quick overview of my background in history and how I got here. So um, uh, I started out my career nowhere near tech. I, I was a, uh, a an instructor of French and Italian up in uh, Phillips Exeter Academy in, in New Hampshire. So it was quite a leap from, from language teaching over to tech. Uh, but I made that leap and I made it in the language industry. So I worked for a couple of companies where uh, they provided language translation services and then language translation technology. And it was the latter that really, really was exciting to me from a, a perspective of um, how you can utilize technology, both relational databases leading to AI, neural and statistical AI, to solve uh, larger problems. And there was a lot of provenance built into uh, what we did, which turns out to be quite a big thing in blockchain, right, in, in, in Bitcoin. Um, and so eventually I uh, was asked to become a professor at uh, Fordham and they said, hey, do you, do you want to teach about compliance? Because I'd been a CEO of a compliance company. And I said, uh, absolutely not. No, I, I don't want to teach about compliance at all. <laughs> um, and they said, well, what do you want to teach about? And I said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll teach Bitcoin to people if, if they sign up for the class. 
Uh, so I, I joined joined a Fordham as uh, a professor teaching Bitcoin to students, and it turned out that. Uh, the attendance cycle and the interest is completely relational to the price of Bitcoin, by the way. So when Bitcoin is pumping to amazing heights, we have like an overabundance of students that, that want to get into the courses. And uh, when Bitcoin's in a massive bear market, there's a lot less interest uh, <laughs> until recently, until this last term when people started to get excited, independent of whether the price was up or down. So that, that was super exciting. That's kind of how I got into it. Um, I, I started learning about Bitcoin in 2016. Uh, and then in 2017, made my first purchases, uh, held through thinking I was a genius, right through 2017 and 2018. And I had that horrible pit in my in my stomach, as everybody else did when it finally dropped off a cliff to 3000. But uh, I had a great mentor who, who spent loads of time with me, uh, pointing me in the right direction as to why Bitcoin is the solution to the world's problems long term on so many different levels. Yeah. So what, what are kind of like first principles that are like influential in shaping your view on this when you say like this, this is the the solution to the big problem. Can you can you touch upon that? Absolutely. I mean, it's socioeconomic. Um, you know, you have cultural uh, phenomena that exist with Bitcoin. Uh, I mean, ultimately, in a world denominated by central monetary control, Bitcoin is the currency of peaceful resistance, right? Um, and I think about that a lot, particularly when we, we first kind of connected and, and you run this podcast largely well, for a lot of people, but also for millennials who are thinking about, you know, getting involved with, with Bitcoin. Um, the world has been plagued with resistance that has tended to be violent and physical for hundreds and hundreds, thousands of years. We actually have this invention called Bitcoin, which provides a peaceful path to world peace at the end of the day. And I truly do believe that. Uh, if, if you think about the current fiat system, it has been manipulated by central governments over the past couple of hundred years uh, uh, to basically wage war, right? To print money, to invest and expand and wage war. And ultimately what happens in those situations is when they take over uh, enemy land, they end up uh, reaping the resources from that enemy land to pay back the loans and debts of fiat currency. And that cycle goes on and on and on and will continue to go on as long as we are uh, primarily denominated on a fiat uh, standard. Bitcoin, and I don't need to preach this to you, you and I are, are, are both in the same camp here, but Bitcoin is a truly scarce, limited supply monetary system. Uh, which basically means that uh, as it gets adopted worldwide, it becomes deflationary as opposed to inflationary. Uh, so from, uh, from a, a government perspective and control perspective, governments who adopt Bitcoin as legal tender will not be able to easily manipulate it to build their war machines out, right? Yeah. Um, I think socioeconomically and culturally, we have, uh, and, and people have different views on this, and that's absolutely fine. I think we have entered into hyper consumerism uh, where you need the next iPhone, not you know three years from now, but six months from now, you need the best TV, you need the best car, the best devices. And we're all addicted to social media, which if you actually look back is only 15 years old. Uh, we, we live in a very different world right now. In a deflationary economy, if Bitcoin were to take hold, people would hold off before making you know, active consumer based decisions, because that Bitcoin might be worth more next month, next quarter, next year. So uh, it is a very different world we'd be looking at, but I think a much more peaceful world. Hey there, I want to ask you for a quick favor. I noticed something interesting. 75% of my viewers aren't subscribed yet. Subscribing helps me grow this channel, ensuring more great content each week. So if you're enjoying our conversations on Bitcoin for Millennials, please consider hitting the subscribe button on YouTube or the follow button on your favorite podcasting app. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that. And, and obviously I, I see it as that too. But what I find difficult, I think, especially with my generation is the yeah kind of like trust that people have in 
the institutions that govern us, right? I mean, I, I grew up in the same way. And even now when I'm saying that, I feel like I'm going against what I was taught or something. So I, 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 and, and I think about, oh, what do other people think about it when I say that? You know, like, it's funny. You're like really programmed to just just follow that institution and be like, well, they, they, will pro they probably mean right, you know, and they have my interest at heart and all these things. And that's also why I find the personal journey into Bitcoin so interesting because you have to realize that that is not the case, right? But when you mention, and, and I'd love to unpack that war angle, right? Like you say, the countries that have a fiat standard are actually incentivized to wage war to, to, to keep that currency alive, right? And how can they do that? Well, they can create this currency. They can pay the soldiers, eventually force the people to, to comply, right? And it's like a never-ending cycle. And creating new money creates inflation, right? You can buy less with the same amount of units of the currency you have as compared to a deflationary environment where you can actually buy more with less of the units that you have, right? So it's a, it, it's a complete paradigm shift. And I think that combined with the words, the, the government is incentivized to wage war, is just very confrontational for people. And I just love to hear like your idea about how, how can we explain that in like more friendly terms? You know, it, it is a reality and I think so too, but it took me a while to get there, right? And I think... It it, it, it it puts a lot of people off if we talk like that. Yeah, it's um, it's it's a tough pill to swallow, right? And and ultimately, you know, you're looking at you're looking at the difference between emotions, human emotions, and pure logic and math. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think every nation state's core mandate and right and responsibility is to protect itself. Um, yeah. And to ensure the safety and comfort uh, and protection of, of its people. But there have throughout history been multiple, uh, uh, you know, examples where, where countries kind of uh, take advantage of that. And that could mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, for example, in World War II, uh, the entire doctrine of uh, Nazi Germany was basically, you know, protection and freedom of its people through expansion and land. Um, so we're going to protect our own people, but we're actually going to do that by taking over other countries so our own people have more land uh, to live with. And, and you see that across, uh, you know, time with, with uh, multiple institutions, whether that be physical through, through war, whether you actually see that uh, economically driven through control. Um, and so... The, the reality is humans are driven by emotions. They, they always will be. Uh, and therefore, having a system of checks and balances with money that is uh, unemotional, that is logical and math-based, would be a nice system of checks and balances to see whether that activity was truly, truly warranted or not. Yeah. Yeah, it's the... Trust rules, not rulers, right? It's, it, I think it's, <laughs> totally. it's, it's, it's that because, and I think it's important to emphasize it's not about there's evil people in the government, etc., but just the system of how fiat governments are incentivized to keep themselves alive, right? Yes, by the individual people that work in the, or lead that government, but it's it's kind of like when you when you are elected and you get into the government and you're there for long enough you are part of the of the path dependency that's already there right so it's not even in in most cases it's not even your fault and and people think they are doing the right thing you know and etc so it's not i i would argue not not that the most people are not malicious or evil or you know whatever they are they are following this path that has been there way before they were even born, right? And I think that is what is so difficult with this paradigm shift. It's because these people are in the government. They are the rulers. We have to follow these rulers that can change at any time, right? But the, the rules versus rulers thing is that if we, if something would exist that has transparent rules that anyone can adopt voluntarily versus forcibly like any fiat currency basically wherever you're born 
Um, and we can follow this set of rules and we are kind of like incentivized to follow the rules because everyone else is incentivized to follow the rules. That takes away that emotion part that you talk about and then we are less dependent on the people in the government, whoever they are, you know. Um, and, and there is kind of like this, I don't like the word playing field, but it is like the fair. It's an equal um, playing field for everyone and there's no difference anymore, right, between the people that are randomly elected into government and and the plebs below them totally I, you know you and i are fortunate enough to live in democracies so you know we yes. have the opportunity to 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 voice our opinion and and vote and i remember speaking with uh, you probably know peter saint Ange. uh mm -hmm. he's he's on twitter and i i spoke with him a number of months ago and uh he said, look, you know, and we agreed, we love America and I'm sure you love, you know, Holland. Um, you know, it, it's, it, we love our countries and our countries afford us the ability to voice our opinions and vote. And uh, we vote with Bitcoin. That's kind of yes. the, the conclusion we came to. Yeah. Uh, and that is the system of checks and balances we've been given uh, in terms of, of alternate monetary policy. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I see it as a different system that you can opt into, right? And therefore, by, by opting into the provably better, more transparent, equal, apolitical, a-religious, all these things, you know, that system, you show your, by showing your support for that system, you're, you show your, um, how do you say that, abjection? I don't know, the, the, the you know, the, the um, I don't even know the word. But you're yeah, not yeah, accepting, but... you know, that system that, that you were born into again. And that will force the people who run that system to, you know, I think that's the concept, right? Like bend the knee to that new system, which is just provably better. And that is kind of like the fight that we're in, I would say. And, and it is that big, you know, um, I think we'll get to that. But like how broken money breaks your incentives and therefore, you know, it influences your life. Um in, in a way that just should not happen, you know, and I think that is that is what we're in. Yeah, and it, it's interesting. If, even if we put Bitcoin aside for just a second and talk about macro megatrends, uh, I, I really do think the output of 2008 and, and the great financial crisis was a ripple effect of decentralization. Um, and, you know, we see it with money and Bitcoin. Uh, we see that social media, when, when not overly controlled, can actually provide a great platform of independent thought and, and voices and conversations. Um, we see that uh, people are kind of calling out their governments now. You know, the, 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 the tricks that were so easily used, right, um, mm. to sway momentum, they just can't be used as much anymore. And really yeah. what, I, what I see happening is more power, that power shift is kind of coming back to the people. Um, and and, and it, there are going to be bumps along the road and there's going to be pain and some hemming and hawing and stretching and pulling. But ultimately, you know, it is a good thing when the people have more control than than government because i'll tell you something you know we have issues across the world but i guarantee you if you know i sat down with a group of people from russia or china or even north koreans we'd probably have a blast together we'd have a great time together oh as i people, would agree yeah right yes. as people yes, correct the governments um you know have an agenda which sometimes you know is is again protective and sometimes not but i, I think people getting together across multiple nationalities uh, there's nothing but kindness and caring and, and curiosity and love for, for people. So um, that's where I'd, I'd like the end result of this decentralization project to land. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree. I um, While you were talking, I thought, yeah, this... The, it's kind of the information asymmetry is gone, but... but between the government and the people. It's still there, of course, but we outnumber any size of any government. You know, I find that so fascinating, you know, and, and the fact that all that information is already there and and for anyone to to judge, right? Although the people in charge scream misinformation, disinformation, right? That like that it's funny, if you, if you're like a real rational thinker, 
that should be your signal, right? Totally. Because any information should exist. And if you cannot counter it with the truth, then the truth is not in your corner, you know? And I think this, this is what people are seeing in, in a way that they are starting to feel like, hey, this information that I got from like a thousand other people is way more transparent, way more verifiable than the information that I got from three government officials, which, you know, has maybe also been debunked, but just because they are in a certain position, I am programmed to trust them, right? And I think that is also part of that paradigm shift that you start to realize like these little, these little cracks. And again, as you alluded to, eventually it's a good thing because yeah. we all get to figure out that we can just work together and build together and, and that we should get an incentive system, i.e. A, a monetary system that just throws that all out of the window, that we Absolutely. don't have to trust another person and therefore we can trust everyone in, in, this, money, in, his, in this money system. Totally, totally. That, that becomes the lingua franca ultimately. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's the last big hurdle you know, for, for us to achieve that, that kind of truly worldwide decentralized, um, outcome. And, and then, oh my God, imagine what we can do as a human society after that. Imagine what we could invent together as a collective hive, uh, as opposed to, you know, being in our own silos in our own little holes. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I get quite excited. A lot of people feel concerned for their children and their children's children. I get excited about you know, what we can solve as humans. Well, we go from what you mentioned, the consumerism, you know, we go from consuming to building. And I think yes. when I think about the future, I think like, well, if we go there, like what did we actually experience? Was that building or was that consuming? And I think it was consuming, which was great, obviously, um, you know, best time to be alive ever, probably of, of anyone who ever lived. But yeah, we can probably do so much more. So I love that. That's that's a very that that positive outlook is what everyone needs, right? I think well, that's what Sailor says. Like Bitcoin is hope, but it's that. Like you have to have hope for the future. Like or else, like what are you doing now? There's only yep. uh, you. You need that. Everyone needs that. Yep, absolutely. And and uh, that also when you when you come to to Bitcoin and and you know how do I handle Bitcoin? The first thing question I get is, well, it's so volatile. When do I buy? When do I sell? I hear this constantly. <laughs> uh, or I'm going to buy for a little bit and get out and look, I made 12% on our not a genius. You know, my, my response is, look, uh, you, if you're younger, you have a benefit that most other people don't have, and that's time. Time is worth more than, than, than money or, or anything else in this world. And if you just look at the average compound annual growth rate of Bitcoin, right? Over, you can even lop off the first five years, but just over the past decade, um, this, this thing is a savings technology. It's, it's not to be spent. Uh, it's meant to buy in, you buy into the network in small quantities, only what you can afford over the course of time. And the compounding effect of Bitcoin will make you better off in the long haul. Um, and we've seen a whole bunch of things come out. We've seen, you know, uh, Plan B's S2F models. Uh, this, this, this cycle, it's the power law, right? That's the mm -hmm. that's the 2021 version of the S2F uh, stock to flow. Um, then we've got our our kind of retirement calculators that are floating around everywhere, so people can get excited about. Bitcoin. Those are all well and good. They create buzz and they create excitement and, and they get you to fall asleep with the last thing thinking about what kind of yacht you're going to get or island you're going to build. <laughs> but ultimately, the best thing you can possibly do is just buy on DCA, dollar cost averaging, and just forget about it for quite yeah. a while. Uh, yeah. And you will be better off. Well, it is funny because most people get into it for a number go up, right? And, and you think about, oh, I'm going to I never thought about a boat, but yeah, like I'm going to buy a boat. But what you will find, and that sounds like a snake oil salesman, right? Once you adopt Bitcoin, you will figure out that you will not, you, you won't want to, you will not want to buy all those things, yeah. which is funny. Like that, that is, that, that is the change 
you know, in this consumer mindset to a builder mindset. It's like, I'm not going to buy stupid shit anymore. <laughs> Bitcoin That's allows, Bitcoin so allows you to, to create long-term wealth through yes. the perfection of a long lost art, which is patience. Yeah. Right? And it's not necessarily wealth, I'd say in dollar or, or any fiat denominated terms, but it's the wealth of, of deciding what you want to do with your life, right? Because eventually yeah. it's, it's time that you create for yourself. And in that time you can build whatever you want, right? Like whatever your skill set or, or interest is. And, and I think that is, that's what I've come to learn as the, the wealth part in that sense. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the interesting thing is it's you, you, you look at this maturity curve of Bitcoin uh, and we certainly had we're past the early adopter phase. I can see that now. You know, it's becoming commonplace to talk about Bitcoin. Um, you know, going back to how we first connected, you know, I, I presented at this financial advisor and wealth manager conference yeah. and. I always thought they were going to be the last nut to crack, right? I, I actually believe the youth and millennials get it. They understand technology natively much better than, than older generations. I know there's a lot of shit coining that goes on. There's a lot of, I missed Bitcoin. So let's get into the mm -hmm. other 500,000 coins. I, I, I realize that, but everybody went through that, that learn by fire phase. Or, you know? or will go through that. Right? Or will or will learn. <laughs> yeah. And and for anybody listening now that is doing that, I can only tell you that uh, if you stay <laughs> within this it. if you stay within this industry, you will come back to Bitcoin. Um, yeah. I can guarantee you of that. Yeah. Whatever, Wait, whatever that before helps. We continue, before we continue, I wanted to share, of course, this is what I wanted to talk about, right? Because this yeah. is how we connected. So, so you did this presentation for a few hundred like financial advisors, wealth managers. And I wanted to start with the summary quickly. Yeah. And, and, and then let's dive in further. But your summary, there is a thread. I will link to mm -hmm. it. It said, you know, they are coming. They are coming for all our Bitcoin. Ignore the daily, weekly, monthly noise. Secure your part of the future economy. Your time is now and your kids and grandkids will put statues up in honor of the Bitcoin decisions you make today. I mean, that got me hyped up, obviously. <laughs> so I think that's when I DM'd you. you know, and, and of course, this is kind of like, this is the number go up type-ish hype up approach, which, which I like. But, you know, it's, it's true because, you know, the, the, um, eventually money does rule the world and money creates our incentives. Money is the tool that we use to communicate with each other what, what value represents. If I do something for you, you give me an amount of units of the currency we use and that represents in nominal terms the value that I give to you, right? So whether, you know, you like the topic or, of money or not, like it's just how it is, but, or well, we need money, a good money. But currently, because the money is broken, people do all these different sorts of things to invest in to, to try to keep the value of their money, right? And I think that is the topic that uh, I'd love to talk about and also that you shared because you talked to people who actually manage that for other people. Um, yeah, so that was the intro I wanted to do. But but now if we continue, <laughs> what, what was that experience like? So you had that presentation. What, what really stood out to you? Sure. So I'll, um, I'll give you a, a, a very quick backstory just to set everything up. I, I launched a company called LearnBitcoin.io. Uh, anyone can get educated there, anybody who's Bitcoin curious, but the focus and specialization is on uh, educating financial advisors and wealth managers about Bitcoin and they can earn their uh, continuing education credits, which is really cool. So they actually earn their, their required credits while they learn. And so I've, I've done a number of these presentations and keynotes in the past. And every single time I get on stage, you know, I go through and I try to create the most simple explanation of Bitcoin possible. And then I get the same questions, the same one-on-one questions over and over and over again. So I had, I had walked into this keynote, you know, saying I've stacked enough Bitcoin. Maybe, maybe this is it, right? Like I've, I've got enough. And then after I finished the keynote and, and listened to all the questions that came back from financial advisors and wealth managers, I was like, hey, should I mortgage like everything I have and buy more Bitcoin like right now, <laughs> right now wow. before they, wow. before they come in. And 
you know, this was, it was an interesting time because, you know, the ETF had launched, there were about like 150, 200 people in, at the, at the event, um, you know, and, and the ETFs had launched, they had record inflows, like 74 days of straight inflows into, into BlackRock's ETF. The 13 Fs were coming out. So all of the, uh, firms that ha- are required to disclose their Bitcoin or ETF holdings are starting to disclose. It turned out over 400, I think, um, yeah. actually disclosed. And so I was riding a pretty, pretty good train coming in. But the questions that I got from these financial advisors and wealth managers were really, really intelligent questions. Um, they were asking about sharp ratios. They were asking about average returns against major indexes. They were asking about self-custody options, even if they're financial advisors and wealth managers. Um, they, uh, they, were, they were ahead of me on my slide. So as I'm breaking down what mm. blockchain actually is, they're, they're kind of asking questions that are three slides ahead. And I, I kind of paused mid-keynote and I thought, oh my God, they, they are really coming. This is it. Like mm. we've all been waiting. You know, we've been saying the institutions yeah. are coming for a long time. And I, I left that completely convinced that the institutions are now coming. Yeah. Um, and that's what got me so hyped up uh, to jam that that Twitter thread out there because I was like, guys, you know, the stack time, certainly the time for the average, you know, Joe or Jane to, to get their a whole Bitcoin. It's just coming. It's coming to an end. It really yeah. is. And it's going to be sad when that happens, you know? Yeah. I fully agree. I think I have a few questions, but this point is like, I, I think it's sad that the finance bros figured it out, <laughs> but that is also the nature of Bitcoin, right? Like anyone can adopt it. I think it's a very clear signal that, you know, the fact that 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 Wall Street is adopting an idea that was launched on a random internet forum 15 years ago is absolutely mind-blowing. You know, any anyone saying it's a Ponzi, Tulip, blah, blah, like total disbelief. Like, please check yourself if you really think that because this, it, it's so incredible that they, j- after just 15 years, adopted this. I, I don't know, like, how much of a beer signal you need. Obviously, there's an incentive for them. You know, they can make money with their fees, but it also... You know, it's part of this game theory and this aligning of incentives. Like the more Bitcoin they have, the more they, uh, the more they are, in, are incentivized to to protect it, right? And if you've ever worked in a big company, you know what it's like. You know what the what the what the trajectory is like before something is said on TV, right? As a communication line, like how many people sign off on that? Like that's that that's maybe ten people or five people or whatever. Right. And so it has to go through all these layers in a big company before someone like Larry Fink says on TV, it's a flight to safety, you know, whatever you think of Larry Fink and all these things. But the fact that that came out of his mouth is mind blowing because that's not just his opinion. It's his company's opinion. And and, and a legal person signed off on that and all these things, you know, and, and I, yeah, it's like, like, yeah, how, how much more signal do you need? But it's interesting that that even though there's this stamp of approval, you know, for, for people in this space. Of course, eventually, it's all about individuals, right? And and, and individuals running these these firms or wealth management, etc. So there's these le- different levels of of um, of understanding and interest. And I wanted to ask you, like, what are you 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 had some examples, but when when do you know if someone actually did some of the work? You know, what what is the difference between a noob dismissing question and like a I'm 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 almost at the edge question. Oh boy, I've got. I'm trying to think how many bar conversations I've had with, with friends and prospects and clients and things like that. Um, the, by far, for me, the best way to have something stick is to reverse an initial question that they have. So when they start asking you questions back, as opposed to saying, "Oh my God, when is my beer done?" so I can go talk to somebody else. Um, when they when they actually ask you a question back. Uh, that's when you first realize that there's some some element of interest. But then mm. the best thing I think you can possibly do is ask them when they think it's a Ponzi or, or they're not sure yet. I mean, how many have you heard, you know, they can just make more Bitcoin? Like how many times have we heard that? 
Yeah. And, and the interesting thing is they can. That's everybody on this show, like everybody listening to this is like, wait, what? No, it's limited in supply. Well, actually, no. I mean, you can change the code, right? So if you have a majority consent, right, and there are constituents involved, right? Uh, you have developers, you have miners, you have the holders. Um, but, you know, you can change the rules of Bitcoin. That's why it's open source. Yeah. The, the reality, and this is why Bitcoin is so beautiful. There is game theory and economic incentive that actually controls the network in a decentralized fashion. So, yeah, you can go from 21 to 42 million, but that's going to hurt every single person who owns Bitcoin. Um, so, like, I get questions like that, but I reverse it back. Hey, I told you how Bitcoin works. Tell me, explain to me in 60 seconds or less, how does the current monetary system work? <laughs> and when you get people to self-reflect, and yeah. talk to you about that. The first thing they think of is, well, if I'm benefiting, it's okay, right? Um, but they, they they also kind of start to question themselves. So get them to become the teacher. That's what I would say. Yeah, I try to do the same now. I, I, I started with explaining, but now I'm just the annoying uh, why person. You know, why do you believe that? Why do you say that? Why do you ask that? How do you think it works, as you, as you said, right? And I think that is the best way to kind of like trigger people into just having a conversation, like you said, like, uh, and, and uh, again, I have shared this so many times on the, on the podcast. I don't know if you heard this, but like one of my trigger points was when a colleague at a big bank that I worked at explained to me that the money in the bank was not mine. And I was like, what, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and just feeling like I was an idiot participating in a system, you know, I had a mortgage and all these things, uh, that, that I just didn't understand. And that triggered something in me, you know, like, okay what am i actually doing i know i'm benefiting from it because i come in in a you know in a in a in a random stroke of luck i was born in in a rich country so i'm super lucky that you know i'm probably abu abusing the system uh, or using the system to the abusement of, of of other people um but that's not okay i didn't feel okay with that and and that's what was kind of a trigger to to go further into that and i i, I feel like People should start questioning that first before we can, you know, explain factually how Bitcoin works. Like you, you can learn that all over the place now. You have an online course too about that. Like <laughs> that, that is not the point. I think it's more about do you actually understand what you're participating in and what do you think of it once you understand it or when you don't understand it but you're forced to use it? How does that make you feel? You know, like stuff like that. And I, and, I, and, I, yeah. and as well, understanding human nature. So you know, why is it? Uh, that religions focus on uh, glorification of uh, deities or, or, or uh, entities that no longer live. It's because human beings are fallible, right? Human beings make mistakes. Uh, human beings can change their minds. Uh, something that is intangible and unable to be, you know, uh, uh, manipulated uh, is, is, is basically pure and perfect. I see yeah. Bitcoin, and I'm not trying to tie it to a religion whatsoever. I'm trying to tie it to a mathematical logic. Uh, Bitcoin is is uh, as close as you can get in this world to being unable to be tampered, right? And and I always say this, by the way. Speaking of which, like human nature basically dictates a hierarchical structure. We we survived as early stage humans based off the fact that there was somebody or something leading us, and then the hierarchy was built off of that leader. Uh, so we are very, very used to living in a world where we look up at somebody, not just for leadership, but also for accountability. So we can chop their head off if they do wrong and then we put the next person in place. Yes. Um, I would caution people. Uh, we've had, since I've been involved in Bitcoin, many deities, right? Many leaders that we look up to in the space saying those people would never ever do Bitcoin wrong. And time and time again, they end up doing Bitcoin wrong, right? Um, the average Joe, you know, retail uh, believe that Sam Bankman Fried was, was just an amazing individual. Uh, and, and believe it or not, you probably talk to people who, when you hear about Bitcoin and they talk about Bitcoin, they link it to FTX 100%. or something. I, yes, I don't, correct. you know, that the, the correlation there is just insane, even though there is no causation. 
So um, I just say that because there are, we have this cycles and last cycles and other cycles kind of um, leaders, if you will. And Bitcoin wasn't designed to be led. It was designed yes. to have no leader. Uh, and, yeah. and I'll stop there, but I think you, you know what I'm referring to. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I wanted to say it enables you to lead for yourself. I think that is the entire point. And, but that is also why it's so hard to understand. That is also part of this yeah. paradigm shift. I, 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 I love what you said about we want to be led because that is easier and lazier than, than, than doing it ourselves, right? But figuring out that you can do it for yourself is actually way more... Um, it, 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 it empowers you way more than following someone else. But you can only get that realization once you start thinking for yourself, <laughs> you know. And so it's but it's the same principle, I, I think, as with everything in life, right? Like the thing that gives you um, uh, resistance, that gives you resistance, is the thing that you should move into, right? Because once you move into the resistance, then you will get the reward of of understanding, I think this is how I believe it or, or think about it is because I trusted myself and I went through the resistance, I know I can trust myself. I, I've yep. proven to myself that I can trust myself, right? And and this is the same principle, but it's at such a, a high level in a sense that currently you are controlled by the money that you are forced to use, but you don't understand that you are controlled by the money that you are forced to use, right? And once you kind of like peek through that door, that's 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 the huge shocker, basically, right? That that gives so much resistance to 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 people. Um, so yeah, I, I I think you said it perfectly there. Yeah. The other um, the other insight from the keynote uh, in front of financial advisors, wealth managers was just a significant unlock. And that is the vehicles that you can use to uh, invest in Bitcoin now. A lot of people, at least in America, uh, don't know that uh, you can buy Bitcoin with your IRA, your retirement accounts. Um, and uh, you have a traditional IRA in which you basically put in pre-tax dollars. And then when you pull it out, when you retire, it's, uh, you got to pay taxes right on mm -hmm. it. But there's also a, a Roth IRA, which you have, you can invest in uh, with post tax dollars. And the benefit of that is that when you retire and you become re uh, of that age where you can start withdrawing, it's all tax free. So if you have, and this is something that, that financial advisors were really keen on talking about as they manage a number of these, um, with low time preference, hold on a second, so I can invest in a Roth IRA. And then if I truly believe Bitcoin is going to appreciate significantly in the future due, it, due to its scarce qualities of limited supply, um, then the best thing I could possibly do is use a Roth IRA. Um, yeah. And, and just uh, pay, it, pay the tax now, basically. Pay the tax now. Um, and, you know, I like uh, the, the, you know, my Bitcoin's in, a, in an IRA. That's what I decided to do. Right. Um, and uh, I, I as much as, uh, you know, and it's it, it's spot Bitcoin as well. So it's not you know, ETF based Bitcoin. But uh, my view was what's the highest conviction play within the framework and structure that we have today? Because I'm certainly not going to, you know, pack up and go to, you know, Uruguay and, and hide mm -hmm. from, from the government. I'm American and I'm happy to be American, proud to be American. I think this is probably one of the last bastions of, of freedom. And if America falls uh, from democracy, then we are in a, a very, very bad place, right? So at some point in time, I kind of take the British hodl um, view here. If, if uh, you have to trust somebody, you have to trust a government somewhere, and I do trust the United States of America. Um, so you know, I, I went through that process of actually converting from a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA. And it was expensive. It's called a backdoor conversion. You have to basically uh, pay taxes, normal income taxes on the conversion. But if you do have massive conviction about um, Bitcoin in the future, it's candidly the best, the best way to go um, yeah. without having to pay the tax ban down the road. Does that tie into something you also shared? Is, is you said you felt that financial advisors and wealth managers were concerned about money printing. It, is this then one of the reasons, you know, if they think it's going to either inflate away or they're going to tax it away, I'd rather yeah, do this now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like these people, these financial advisors, wealth managers have a much lower time preference than the average individual, right? They are, yeah. they are holding, you know, legacy money, 
generational money for people. A lot of times you'll have a financial advisor, that financial advisor then works for the kids and the grandkids and the, at least the family office. You know, the, 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 the um, financial advisory office does that and, and holds that for generations. They're thinking long term. And so, you know, these questions come about, normally anybody in finance gets super excited when rates get cut, right? Because they're like, oh, liquidity back into the, into the markets, all assets, particularly risk assets are going to go up. But I didn't see the same level of excitement on these rate cuts. I, I, I sensed an awful lot of confusion out there from financial advisors as to what's happening. And I think their fear, at least early on, is that we might be at the beginning stages of a really, really bad snowball. Mm. Um, and the, you know, forced cutting, whether it be for election purposes, right, to, to tame the crowd or because we've strained the economy too much and, and over tightened, the next round of cuts could lead to higher levels of inflation like we saw in yeah. the, the mid to late 70s. And so that, like, that's the, the, the tone and the feel that I got. One person took me aside, asked uh, about Bitcoin, and it was in relation to the debt that they were accruing, because I've got some slides on, on just how much debt by the year 2050 we're all going to hold in America anyways. It's about $250,000 per individual, a wow. government debt. Um, so a family of four will owe a million dollars, right? Um, and so th their concern was from the perspective of, uh, of uh, like, the the, the the cat is out of the bag now, right? With money printing, and uh, unless we see some significant and quite painful austerity measures, which no political side is interested in in initiating, you yeah. know, we could we could be in for like the mother of all, you know, recessions down the road. Well, we saw Elizabeth Warren who sent a letter to the Fed or, or to to the government today about uh, or to the Fed. If they, that they should uh, lower lower the rates, which uh, it, it's a sign of where where America is at. I'd say you know, like obviously I view it from an outsider perspective, but uh, yeah, it's 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 fascinating to to follow and also fascinating to see that someone who is actually you know actually has a seat at the table, like Warren, also just doesn't understand how it works you know yeah. and and so many things she says are just so misplaced and um yeah it's just fascinating to follow it from an outside and i agree <laughs> like if america falls we also have a very big problem on this side so there is there's an importance in in following what's happening in america um yeah, I also wanted to ask you, you mentioned this before, but can you talk a bit about investing versus saving with regards to Bitcoin? Like I view it as saving, not investing. I think you do too. But, you know, that has to do with, well, your perception of risk, I'd say. But how, how do you explain that? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, Bitcoin has gone from absolute pure speculation to uh, and, and it evolved to trading and then moved to investing and now you have an early crop of individuals who are saying it's actually a savings technology it's it's not even investing um but that, that's a journey that i think a lot of people maybe have to go through sometimes you you learn more when you go through that experience and and realize and i have realized this time and time again people ask me all the time because of what i do like what's bitcoin doing next I honestly have no idea whatsoever, not even directionally, because the last half a dozen times I tried to time something with Bitcoin, it just completely worked in the opposite direction. It really did. So I'm just, I'm horrible at, at trading, but what I'm good at is, is, you know, buying a piece of my family's future. And that is the savings technology that we're talking about. Um, and that's why I, I do think retirement accounts are a great vehicle for people because you have such a different time preference when you invest yeah. in a retirement account versus something that's easily liquid and can be traded. Um, you know, if Bitcoin goes down and retraces 60%, do I care? No, right? Because I'm like, well, I'm going to win in the long term. I mean, I know I'm going to win. Mathematically, I'm going to win in the long term. So I don't care. And it kind of removes a lot of stress in the process of investing or trading. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think this is a hard thing for people to to understand. Um, 
once that colleague told me the money in the bank is not yours, I realized that I'm saving my my monetary energy, you know, the rewards I got for my work in a system that I didn't understand. And once I researched it, totally didn't align with because I, I understood that it was not working for me, mainly because it's so opaque and, you know, all these elements are abstracted away on purpose for, you know, with, with the purpose for me to not understand it. And then when I saw this, this other system, Bitcoin, which, you know, of which the motto is, you know, um, don't trust verify. It just made su such a complete sense to just move the, the energy I had from one system to the other system. And I don't see it as, and I never saw it as investing. I just always saw it as, yeah, just saving it in another place, you know, like that. That's kind of how I visualize it. It's like a ball of energy that I just put in another box, basically. And the, and the box is verifiable, trustless, you know, permissionless network. Um, but, but people, because it's denominated in dollars or euros, of course, and the price goes up and down, they, they, they feel it's an investing play, but they also feel like that, I think, because they don't even know what saving is. N none of my peers know what actual saving is because in our entire time that we would be able to, to save right from starting your first job at 14, 15 is when the euro got introduced. It already slowly started eroding in value, right? So real saving up until the point that you would actually need it, right? Like when you were starting to, to with your study, for example, or starting with your first house or your family or whatever, like these big points in life for which you would actually save. Most people, you know, come to the conclusion they don't have the money. They, they don't they don't have enough i would say to to acquire what they would have been saving for you know and i think that is just really fascinating that's also why people are forced into this corner of investing i should invest you know what what excess cash i ha i have but when people think about that, you know, you, you see a lot that people feel like they've missed the boat with Bitcoin because there's, you know, these other tokens or NFTs or whatever that, and I think it's unit bias, right? They are $2 or 10 or, or, or a thousand or whatever. They are not 70,000. Um, so, so people are, are kind of like going into that corner of, of investing and taking way more risk versus saving in a system that has very low risk because it's proven to be better than the other system to save it. How, how can we help people understand the difference between not only that behavior, but let's say also crypto versus, versus Bitcoin? Well, yeah. I mean, look, everybody's got to go through, go through their journey. Um, you know, I, I, everybody says to me, what should I do? How, how, how much time should I spend researching before I buy Bitcoin? And if they ask me about Apple or uh, Tesla or NVIDIA or anything else, I'd be like, you should really read all the quarterly and annual reports. You should look at the, you know, the expectations that yeah. the street has for growth, right? You should understand the products. Do you use them every day? And therefore, like, you know, you should probably consider investing. With Bitcoin... You can't do that. With Bitcoin, you just have to buy it. And I, I've, I've, it's a little contrarian, but I do believe that. Like, you got to buy it and you've got to watch it go up and down like the insane beast it is. And then you, you garner a level of respect for it. And that initiates a level of curiosity for people that I think will take them much further than just sitting there uh, in kind of a, uh, a reactive strategy of continuing to research forever. So just bite into the network, hold on to a little bit. And I guarantee you, once you follow it for a little bit, that creates this cyclical effect of curiosity that will never end. I rarely meet people who get into Bitcoin, hold it for a while, have some left and aren't really kind of continually mm -hmm. curious about it. Um, yeah. And uh, the other thing I would say is, if you like Bitcoin, if you're sitting there and you've got a little bit of Bitcoin and you're excited about it, this is a perfect, uh, these opportunities do not come along often. This is a perfect opportunity to contribute 
to an economy that is embryonic and nascent. It's very small right now, but growing dramatically. Like this is your chance, not just to buy into the network, but also go start a company, a Bitcoin company, join a Bitcoin company, contribute passionately to the growth of the ecosystem. I guarantee you when you look back on it, it's going to be one of the most exciting times in your life because this thing, I, I honestly think within the next... 10 years, the price of Bitcoin is going to go where nobody ever thought it was humanly possible to go. Yeah, I think this is also part of that paradigm shift, you know, like when you hear people talk about the, um, um, how, how the world currencies, you know, came and went and the cyclical nature of it and the behavior that people had like when we look at history it feels so distant right and so it's very hard to realize that we are living through it and a few weeks ago i talked to someone who was like yeah but there was also people in the great depression in america or the gold rush right that were also just living at that moment in time but they didn't realize it you know that that would become what what we know as for example the great depression or the second world war or whatever you know but be, and, and, and then the, the internet or the information asymmetry comes back. We can actually figure out that we are living right now in that moment, right? You can contextualize that for yourself. But realizing that you are living through something that will be part of the future's history for a lot of people in a big way is just so unbelievable almost, right? And, and that's when that little... Yeah, I think it's an ego thing or something comes back into play, right? Like, yeah, could this really be it? No, not really. But then, well, maybe, maybe it is. But can I trust my thoughts? I don't know. You know, like it's, <laughs> it's, it's that, I, I think it's that internal journey that, that you have to go through. But once you see that, and I really want to stop using the word believe, but it's like knowing, right? With Bitcoin, you can know because you can verify it all for yourself and you don't have to trust me or you or anyone talking about it. Like you can verify it for yourself. So you can come to understand or know how it works and and what the actual impact, I want to say, first you think could be, but then you think what it will be, right? Because if, when more incentives are aligned in this new system, that old system has to conform to this new system like it's always done, right? From the, the monks writing books to the, the printing press and the people with the horses to the trains. Like it, it's, it's the same thing all over again, you know? And once you see that and accept that, I would say, then, yeah, you, you get into this never ending rabbit hole, which is just super positive, right? Like it's so, it's so positive. That's, that's the, that's the word right there. You know, I've, a lot of people come up to me and after they learn about Bitcoin, they say, all right, I've invested now, but here's my big question. What if it doesn't work in the long run? What if it just doesn't work? What if, what if, you know, we made the wrong decision and I try to turn that around and say, well, what if it does? Mm. What if it yeah. does? we're looking at a, a completely different world and you've got a piece of it, right? Yeah. Well, it's the pure example of, of manifestation in that sense, right? Like having that question is, is it, I, I, when I hear that, when someone says that, I turn it around and then I ask like, why do you ask this question? Think about why you take the nihilistic approach. Why? And can we go through it, right? Like w not only why do you say that, but how can it fail? What can we do to prevent it to not to not fail, right? And and what we can do is to be positive and contribute to it, right? Like actually have something in the future that that we can work towards together, and then we're manifesting it into the future because we are actually contributing to it, right? And yeah, that that uh, yeah, I talk a lot on the podcast about like the spiritual journey and stuff, but that is how you get there, I would say, right? That that you. That, that's what makes you positive about the future, that you can work with other people together also, right? Like if you go, I went to, to Madeira to the Bitcoin Atlantis conference. Insane to see where everyone came from 
to this little island from all these different background, ages, religion, whatever, like all these things don't matter in Bitcoin, right? And then you see like, wow, like all these people are working on this random internet money idea from a forum on the internet. Like that's what we're doing. And I think once you experience that, then then that's that extra kind of like puzzle piece to like trust yourself and, and yeah. your own judgment and, and work and understanding, right? And that's just really... Yeah, again, I think it's it's just really, really positive. I, I wanted to ask you, how far do you think we are in this still early stage, right? Because what I replied to, I think, and in the thread you mentioned, you know, you, say, you said, it strikes me that we have crossed the chasm, right? So that's between, you know, first we have the innovators, then early adopters, right, in this bell curve of adoption. And then we go to early, early majority. And there's a, there's a gap between early adopters and early majority. And a lot of new technology, new um, uh, well disruptions, etc. They 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 fail to cross the chasm, right? They fail to to get to that critical mass of like I think it's uh, like three point nine percent penetration, something, right? To, to get over to this this early majority for for which this technology becomes like legitimized, and so you said, you know. Uh, they are crossing, we are crossing the chasm or we're literally one step away from finding our footing. And I argued in a reply like, yeah, do you really think that? I think we are still early. You know, I, I think less than a million people really understand what this is. I actually currently think it's just, it, it, it is even less than that. But how many people do you think really understand Bitcoin? But also, does it matter? Yeah, I, um, so... So when I when I first started learning about Bitcoin, I was invited to an event in New York. It was kind of like a steak dinner, you know. The the Bitcoin is always like love meat, right? Red meat. And Saifuddin was there launching his his book or pre-launching his book, his first book. Um, Pierre Rochard was there as well. I don't know if you know Pierre, but good friend. Yeah. He's he's taught in my classes. I've communicated with him and Morgan a lot. Uh, he wrote this article. Uh, on July 4th, 2014, it was called Speculative Attack. Um, and for anybody looking to really kind of juice up on some OG reading, uh, it's just a blog. It's on the Nakamoto Institute. Uh, and Pierre, it's the most prescient uh, article I've ever read because every single thing he's said since 2014 has come true. And there's this one component of the article that basically talks about uh, people not needing to understand it because they're going to be forced, as in forced by economic reality to use it. And I had a discussion with Sam Callahan over at Swan uh, on Twitter recently because he, he posted a really interesting and insightful comment that you know everybody's saying, oh, the banks are buying Bitcoin. And he's like, the banks aren't actually buying Bitcoin, right? They're authorized participants and walk through the process, which was super illuminating. But I did make a comment in there and say, but they have to hold Bitcoin because they're forced, as in forced by economic reality, to hold Bitcoin. So uh, that's why I say we've crossed the chasm. I, I, I really, really do feel that uh, we're, like if you own Bitcoin, continue to DCA, sit back, grab popcorn for the next six to eight years, and watch an absolute replay of what you went over and what you went through your experiences over the past yeah. six, seven years happen in the exact mm. same way at a macro level with Wall Street. It's it's yeah. happening, right? Um, we just got to it first, ultimately. Yeah. Um, I, so that's what I mean. I would actually agree to that. I, 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 I think you're totally right. I think we mentioned it earlier as well, right? They the, the, the more Bitcoin Wall Street holds, the more they are incentivized to protect it. I think that is what you're, yeah. what you're uh, referring to. Uh, yes. You're absolutely right. And and perhaps that, so maybe not in numbers, right? But in, let's say, economic power, you know, that is where, where that is happening. Um, but I think that's a great answer because does it, does it really matter that everyone who has Bitcoin understands it or sees it as how you and I see it now? The, the, the answer is probably no, because once you have it, your interest starts to go further as you and I have also experienced right so in that sense um, yeah I agree and and it will probably also be that that people will start to realize that if they don't have Bitcoin that their options are going to be more and more limited 
uh, as far as like protecting their wealth or building their wealth, right? So in that sense, I think you're right in 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 two ways. You and yeah. I are techies, right? And so we would you, you'll you'll understand this coming completely. When technology is fully adopted, people don't know that they've adopted the technology, right? Correct. It's like nobody understands what TCP/IP is or it's HTTP. Invisible. It's invisible yeah. to them because they see nice clean apps that they download on the app store or websites that they use. Um, equally, you know, speaking about authorized participants and those that need to hold Bitcoin, uh, BlackRock and Fidelity and all of these other major players have already integrated the Bitcoin spot ETFs into their growth funds, their indexes, yeah, exactly. which people are buying, right? Like people already own a, a massive amount of Bitcoin. They don't even know it yet. Right. Yeah. So that's what I mean by the fact that like they, they're investing in it and they don't even know that they're investing in it. And I think that's, if that's starting now, five months after the ETFs, wait another year and mm -hmm. a half, two years. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love what you said about the popcorn. This is, uh, this is literally how I view it. I, uh, I, I shared before in, in the podcast that I once saw a tweet of someone who says, like, if you think Bitcoin, like, I always thought Bitcoin, it's an experiment, right? It's either zero or it's everything. There's no in-between um, outcome. And I, then I, I, I saw a tweet at one point, someone who said, well, if you even remotely think that, you know, Bitcoin is the actual, like, black hole of value, right, that every all the value in the world will be stored into Bitcoin, then you have to get a seat in a stadium. And that was also one of those like trigger moments for me where I was like, yes, like that's a very good point because if this happens, I, I, I need to have that seat in the stadium, right? So that's how I feel now. I'm sitting in my seat with my popcorn and I'm watching this all unfold. And like every day I'm thinking about this, I'm learning about this, I'm talking about this, and it's just super entertaining. Yeah, it's just it is. it's just really entertaining, right? And 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 that's what you know. You have the famous internet meme that says the most entertaining outcome is the most likely. Like, well, then then we're in for something, you know, the next <laughs> ten years, and that would be just yeah. If if we really get to where we think we're gonna go, then yeah, again we manifested that together with like millions of people around the world. We created that all together. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, it must be incredible to uh, to see that. So yeah, and I think again, that's part of the hope for the future, right? Yeah. That just it's just so inspirational to think about if we can actually get there. That's why we have to work on it now. You know, like yeah, that's cool. I uh, I, I have a question related to that because you also shared, you know, that you see or you think that you know Bitcoin is the millennials S and P five hundred. I like that. You know, because there is really no lifeboat for this younger generation. I think I alluded to that earlier, right? Like at this point where young millennials are starting to buy a house or starting a family, you know, they figure out like, I, I don't have enough money or I have a, you know, $150,000 marketing degree and I'm rolling sushi <laughs> or, you know, or, do, or having three jobs at once and I cannot yeah. even, you know, rent a house. Like that's reality for lots of yeah. people in America, right? Um, and the era of money printing, will have to come to an end at some point. So that's where your, uh, your statement, uh, Bitcoin is like the millennials S and P 500. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Like why, why, why will the math save us? Uh, so, uh, Michael Saylor presented in, in, uh, BTC Prague and I have since stolen one of his slides and used it profusely in every presentation I do. And it's basically uh, uh, an X, Y axis of time and value, right? So value going up on the vertical axis and time going across the horizontal axis. And, and, you know, he starts by showing cash money. And he says, look, financial advisors, wealth managers, anybody with half a brain will tell you, you just can't hold on to cash because you're just losing so much value due yeah. to inflation. But then his next slide, a level up from that is gold and stocks. And he's like, you're investing in the S&P and you're investing in gold because it's either a hedge against inflation or it beats inflation. But the reality is it's denominated in fiat. So you're still losing money. <laughs> the only thing, and then you pop to Bitcoin up and to the right on the time value uh, chart, 
the only thing that continues to preserve and grow its value while continuing to be scarce and being resistant to inflation is Bitcoin due to its unique properties. Um, and, and, and that's why I think what you might start to see, and, and I don't think I'm crazy for this because I think it's already been kind of baked into uh, Bitcoin Twitter a little bit. I think you're going to start to see a situation where the 60-40 portfolio is S&P 560 and, and Bitcoin as a heavy percentage of that 40, no longer bonds, no longer gold. Uh, and, and I think that's going to normalize itself in the same way that you and I were normalized to Bitcoin. We bought a quarter of a percent of our, our net worth you know, in Bitcoin, and then you bought a little bit more, and then you bought a little bit more. And then you bought more and just don't tell anybody about it anymore, right? You know, it's kind of, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's one of those situations. And, and I think that's going to happen over time with Bitcoin as well. And I think millennials or, or any, any younger generation that basically figures this out early has an asymmetrical advantage to those who figure it out later. Somebody once famously said to me, you get Bitcoin at the price you deserve, right? Mm -hmm. You take massive risks at ten dollars, right? Yeah, you take massive risks at ten dollars, and 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 you can get the rewards, but you know it's also an issue, um, you know, of of risk. But uh, you know, you buy in at a hundred thousand, two hundred, three three hundred thousand, you still get some upside there, you know, on on this beautiful asset, this pristine form of collateral. But uh, it, it might be less impacted on on the return front. Um, but I'll tell you something: wait until you know five, six, seven years from now when people who have a decent amount of money start to decide that they want to hold Bitcoin instead of real estate. I think that's the next vector of attack for Bitcoin uh, and the next yeah. question people are going to have in their minds. Yeah, I would agree. I, I think uh, I actually had a conversation about this today, but, but once people slowly realize that real estate is so expensive because people are trying to save in real estate, you know, yeah. That's that's when it's really going to shift. But I actually already met some people um, that have sold uh, real estate portfolios of hundreds of houses, all, all for Bitcoin. Yeah, multiple years ago, um, which is incredible for them, right? And their friends still don't understand it, and their friends still laugh at them. Um, but but they already see it, and 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 so it. it what you say, what you say, could be the future is actually already happening. Some people are already seeing that and doing that, and they are very professional real estate investors that completely, well, do a one hundred and eighty on on their entire thesis around real estate, and they, and they turn into Bitcoin. So that that is already happening, not at the scale, you know, uh, that that you know I think you allude to, but uh, yeah, there are people that that already see it, but. When you say like, yeah, this is going to go up forever again, I think, I, I mean, I say this too, there's a, there's a reasoning behind it, right? But just saying that I think already puts a lot of people off because, yeah, why wouldn't you say that, right? Like there's no, you would never say it will go down forever. So it's just like a, feels, feels like a, like an empty argument for, for Bitcoin. Why, why is it? Why is it that it will go up forever? And, and I'll share why, why I think it'll go up forever. How I see it is... And I'm working on an article to explain this, and I call it Bitcoin is the standard measurement for human productivity. If you can, if you think about what the scarcest asset is that we all have, and you mentioned it before, it's our time, right? And therefore, it's also our energy that we expend in a certain amount of time. That's what we do to create whatever value we want to create for other people to use in the value exchange, right? To get a reward for. And so if we spend our finite time and energy and get a reward that's infinitely that can infinitely be created that yeah what are you doing like that's the dumbest trade to to ever make right and so i feel that there's only one fair reward and that is a scarce asset that's only comparable to time which I heard Michael Saylor say in his, uh, his "There's No Second Best" presentation as well. But it's that, right? Like it's it's something. This discovery is something that you can only relate to time. But that is actually perfect because if we can reward real time with something that is different but similar to time, then we have a way more equal value exchange. And once people start to figure that out, 
eventually all their productivity, the rewards that they get, for, you know, which represents their productivity, will be stored in Bitcoin. And because that productivity is infinite, Bitcoin will go up forever against everything else that you could store that energy in. Yep. That's, that's actually much more beautiful than a description I would have. I think we should stick with that one. Um, but okay. like, I, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'd like that's, that's the most like that, that fund, whatever I would say now would kind of pale in comparison to that. Cause I was so intently listening to you there. I was like, yes, that's the one. Um, I, I think, I think if like, it depends who you're speaking to as well. Like if I speak to somebody who's in finance or an economist, you know, I talk about um, uh, price equilibrium, which is a very well understood concept within economics. It means if if you have um, uh, a certain level, again, X Y axis chart, where you kind of draw your squares at the the end point of that square, you have what's something called price equilibrium, and that's where supply equals demand, right? Yeah. And that's how that's how economists tend to to focus theoretically, anyways, on pricing. But the problem <laughs> that economists have with Bitcoin and modeling it into that price equilibrium is the supply is not fixed. The supply is having. So as yeah. long as the demand remains even constant and the supply halves, you still don't have price equilibrium. Uh, you, you are unable to find price. And we call that price discovery. Anybody who's seen Bitcoin go over its all-time high knows what that word means. It means where the heck is this thing going to land? before it retraces and that's price discovery but i think zooming out over a 50 100 200 year span um you know ultimately it's very difficult for bitcoin to find its price assuming demand remains constant and as you said we're still at one percent a half a percent of the world that truly gets this and or is adopting it so got a long way to go before we have to worry about price stabilization in my mind yeah yeah, I agree. It's it's just it's just hard to predict because there's nothing like this, right? So that's that's also where the entertaining part, I'd say, come come comes in. Yeah. Um, my last three questions, if you still have time. Yeah. Um, you shared with me before that you've had many conversations trying to get people off zero, but you struck out a lot too, right? Uh, and and uh, yeah, I, I have the same experience. You cannot orange peel someone, right? They have to orange peel themselves. Why do you keep doing it? Um, I, I, like, I, I, I started my career as a teacher, an educator. I'm, I'm, I'm teaching and educating now at, at Fordham. I love it when you break through to somebody and, and they get it. Now, when I teach my classes, you know, anywhere between 12 and a couple of dozen pe uh, students in the class, you know, nobody, not everybody comes out orange-pilled. There are always a few that are like heavily orange pilled and are investing and starting companies and all that kind of stuff. There are some that remain hesitant to invest, but the key aspect is they all understand it. And I think yeah. that's my goal, whether somebody ultimately decides to participate in the network or not, if they understand it, then my job is done. And, and by the way, as a, as a free market individual, as a general libertarian, I don't care where people spend their money or what they do with it. You do whatever you want. You want a shit coin, go and shit coin. If you want to go and, you know, invest in other things, go and do your own thing. But it's our, our role and responsibility as Bitcoiners to open up the avenue of education. So at least we've done our part in explaining why we're so passionate about the next world reserve currency. Yeah, I love that. I think I, I, I did some teaching, not a lot, but that what you describe, I, uh, I, I love. And it's that you show to another person why you are so enthusiastic and that what is triggered in, in them is like, huh, Keith is really passionate about this. Why could that be? You know? And, and that is then the start for their own, their own journey. And, uh, I think, yeah, I love, I love that you say that because if you get to that point, you know that you've done your job, you, you conveyed your own enthusiasm, and knowledge to that other person and that's the only thing you can do right as as with teaching anything yeah. basically yeah, totally very cool so what does having a low time preference mean to you how 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 have you incorporated that into your life or how has that new preference changed your life 
Yeah, uh, you know, for for those uh, most people should should understand what these things mean. But a high in time preference is a requirement for immediacy. It doesn't necessarily have to be a negative thing. So, for example, if you're in a, a third world country and and uh, you know you're starving, you have a high time preference for food because you need food to survive, and so that's an immediate need. Um, yeah. A low tie preference generally in, in investing or saving means that uh, you are able to have a conversation with yourself 20, 30, 40, 50 years into the future and you can turn yourself around. And if you're older, you know, the older version of yourself can turn around and say, well done, Brahm, or well done, Keith. You know, you made the right decisions and you have ideal or perfect low time preference, right? Um, so I would always say to people, if you want to build on low time preference, Imagine yourself decades into the future, turning around and talking to yourself now. You know what would you want to accomplish? Whether it's investing in Bitcoin, or um, you know health, or success in in life, uh, relationships, whatever it happens to be. You know, constantly put yourself in check as to what your future self would want. And that you know, Bitcoin's kind of taught me because you do you learn patience when you hold Bitcoin. Boy, do you learn patience. Um, you know, it's taught me that there are more important things short to medium term, uh, than even Bitcoin, uh, and, and having a low time preference on Bitcoin means you don't have to worry about it every day. And as you say, you, you illustrated it and, and said it perfectly. Time is the only asset, uh, that evades us. It's the only asset mm -hmm. we can't as humans control. So anything that you can do to buy back more time and quality time with family and friends and doing things you love with people you love. That is an extremely important and crucial thing that you need to start learning about and perfecting. For me, that's Bitcoin. Yeah. I just hear the word wealth <laughs> like that is wealth. Yeah. Just enjoying or being mindful of the time that, that you go through, right? It's uh I don't know if you know Jimmy Carr, the comedian. Yeah. Yes. And they, there's this really great clip uh, where an interviewer asks, what, what is the meaning of life? And his answer is enjoying the passage of time. Yeah. And, and that's what I think about when you just shared it. Like, it's that. And, and enjoying with what, that doesn't really matter. What, whatever you want, yeah. right? But it's being mindful of that time and, and, and really living through that so that you don't regret spending it on something that you didn't want to spend it on right. right because you can never get it back yeah um yeah i love that last question and i ask everyone the same question which is what is a core belief you will never let go um i would say uh you there's only one thing that uh you can prioritize in life. Uh, and that is family. And if you don't have family friends, um, that has driven every decision I've made in business, in life and in investing. Uh, we've all had too many experiences where loved ones or personal friends or others have, have left us too early. Uh, and in many ways, life is, is Russian roulette. You never know how long you're going to be on this earth. So, um, spend that crucial time with the highest level of quality possible. Uh, and I think that will pay back more and more dividends than you can imagine. Um, that's what I would say. Great ending. Thanks so much for, for sharing. Uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. Great jam and uh, happy to be connected. And uh, yeah, man, I will, I will link to all your profiles and your website so people can follow you, check out what you do. And uh, yeah, Appreciate your time. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Will. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke. That's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.